Today's episode is part of a mini-series that we will be peppering in amongst our other interviews. For this series, we go inside the walls of Intevity and hear from experts who are doing the hard work to help our clients. We discuss the patterns and the pitfalls, and we glean some insight from their many years of experience. I love showcasing our team. They're solution-obsessed, and in my very biased opinion, I think they're some of the best out there. Let's hear from the team. So today, we're going to discuss the death of the cookie and what the heck does that mean? What's the impact? What should people be doing? So let's just start with the, the easy question, I guess, which is, what does that even mean, the death of the cookie? Basically, what's happening, um, Chrome is making a major change to its browser. They are sunsetting the use of third-party cookies, basically default deny. And this is all under the guise of privacy for the consumers. This has been a long time coming. They've actually been talking about this for about two plus years, and it's been deferred and kicked off for various reasons, including litigation, but also just the implementation wasn't ready for the new Google privacy sandbox and the proposed future. But they're trying to harden the way that advertisers access information about its users and what type of information is actually transmitted between site to site. Is this all cookies or are there specific cookies that are being targeted here? No, this is limited to third-party cookies. So the difference between uh, cookies, first-party and third-party, first-party cookies are anything that you write and distribute within your own domain, within your own four walls. Third-party cookies are basically bits of text that other sites have access to and track behaviors from site to site to site. And the impact, like, is it just ads or is it is it more than that? It's mostly ads. It's definitely targeted and centered around advertising. That's the general use case for third-party cookies. But there is some functionality uh, that might be dated that could still rely on third-party cookies, such as you know single sign-on services um, that could be impacted. So the call to arms here is really pay attention to not only your advertising and analytic performance with other vendors and not Google Analytics specifically, um, but also, you know, blanketly test your site using the provided tools and mechanisms by Google to audit for site functionality breakages. It's unlikely, but if your site contains a shopping cart and real dollars are exchanged, I would be hesitant to not give an audit a try. Donald, when, when talking about impact as well, there's a lot of impact for potential for people who had just analytics on their applications and weren't doing anything specific with third parties, correct? Absolutely. And the types of analytics that you have on your site really matter here. So I, I think it's super common to have Google Analytics tied to your site, and that's protected. Um, Google has made sure that its solutions are trued up and this is actually a topic to get into a little bit as well. It's a little bit nefarious, this action that Google is taking because it really takes power away from other solutions, whether they're advertising, which, you know, good, I'm all for privacy, but also other analytic solutions as well uh, would have access to less data. Google has made the move a uh, year plus ago from their usual G tag implementation to what they're referring to as the one tag. The reason why it's called the one tag, it's, you know, if you read their documentation, they actually call it a first party cookie approach, even though they are themselves a third party, but effectively their systems are able to talk to each other with zero impact on this change that they are making. Mm -hmm. So Google Analytics, Floodlight, Google Ads, 360 CM, all are going to be fine. They're still going to be able to access information if, if you browse between sites and they are implemented with a Google product such as Analytics, Ads, or other. That information is all still going to talk to each other in Google's proprietary way. What everyone else is going to have access to or needs to adjust to is this very limited uh, set of information that's really more topical. So not, you know, you're this age in this geolocation with this set of interests. I think there was a, a page that they used to share back in the day. I'm not sure if it's still up where you could actually see 
who Google thought you were. And it would provide an output of like, you know, here's your interests. Here's a list of things that you're into and other sites that you browse. Everyone else is just going to get subscriptions to basically topical information. So this person likes to shop. They enjoy the color pink. They're really not going to have access to the same level of information, such as like your your age and, and you know, address details. And, and just last question around impact. What is, you know, the ownership of this problem? How is Google transferring that ownership over and who are they transferring it to? It's really on the vendors. So this is a tough scenario because a lot of these pixels and trackers sites will just add these. It's very common over my years to, if we need a solution for tracking or ad retargeting, any, any sort of metric data, uh, the user journeys flows. It was a common process to just get out the company credit card and add the new tracker. And hopefully they, you know, promise some sort of lift against conversion or other that they can demonstrate. All of their individual solutions, these vendors, they're relying on the old uh, cookie mentality that is suddenly going away. So it's not individual products and companies that need to respond to this. It's really on the advertising vendors. And what makes this extra tricky, I just mentioned that it's very common for sites to build up a roster of these types of vendors. Each one of them is going to have to respond to this in their own unique way. So it's extra critical. One that you know who is on your site, do a site audit, know what tags are in use and what's required, what's critical to your business. And then reach out to the vendors and ask them point blank, you know, what is your response to this change coming up? How is your solution going to be impacted? Or is there anything we need to do on our end? There are avenues for adjusting to this technology using the topics API, partitioning cookies for more bespoke or or custom solutions. But really the onus is going to be on each individual vendor. You you know, the funny thing is, is I saw it as more of a move of taking ownership as the provider, as the person who has the analytics to say, okay, great, I'm no longer going to trust this third party to do it. I'm intentionally going to make everything a first party cookie and then send that integration over to that third party vendor. So basically the, the, the property that owns the analytics now is in charge of the data, but then you're taking on more work than you used to. There's a bit of a push pull happening right now with this as well, where vendors are kind of taking the opportunity to tell uninformed or uh, maybe not ready clients to say, hey, you know, this thing is coming. You have our client side cookie or solution implemented. Can you turn on this server side offering? Just to explain that a little bit, uh, client side, when you load up a website, you browsing that site, you're considered the client. There's a bunch of scripts, third parties that load. They could be Google Analytics. They could be other affiliate vendors and other trackers. Server-side implementation is when that site that you are browsing moves these solutions to 100% server-side. So it disconnects the vendor having access, direct client access to your browser window. And basically, the, the site you are browsing sends over very explicit data. If it's a conversion flow, they're sending over what's being purchased um, by, you know, if they collect hashed emails or or other, um, they're basically doing this for conversion tracking. But everything is a data negotiation with these third parties. And unfortunately, the default side of that is they'll always ask for as much data as they can collect. Being or having access to the client side is the goldmine. Because even if you send things explicitly to an endpoint, they have access to the client. They can check the window referrer object. They can see all this other behavior. And up until now, they could see all your other cookies and all this other information by all these third parties. This isn't the solution. The move to server side is not the end-all be-all here. Yes, it will work for some things, but what I found almost all of these vendors in that data negotiation where, you know, more is more, they still want you to keep the client side right. turned on, which is extra nefarious. Um, they want both. Yeah, they, they want it all, wait for it to break and, and 
let them respond basically because you know if if they get some data it's it's more data that's what they want kind of like mother nature advertising always finds a way so with with all this will our privacy actually be better or is it all just window dressing to an extent I mean, there, there is basically a fire drill going on that is going to shut off this connection to a, a slew of vendors. But Google is really positioning themselves as the identity management authority. And that's problematic. I mean, they're still going to have, like I, I mentioned before, access to their own solutions as first party. They're not going to be impacted by this. So... You know, Google's sense of you is going to go up still or continue to climb. Imagine all these other vendors, too, if they rely on anyone else that, you know, requires third party cookies. They're considering now moving to Google as an out of the box, potentially free solution. We're just going to end up giving more and more data to Google. Google is also the lion's share. I would think with its suite of products, because, you know, with startups, mid sized companies, why pay for an enterprise solution that you have to custom tailor or do things on your own side anyways, when, you know, I can just drop a G tag on a site and you have, you know, all that access you see in Google reporting. Some of this changed with the move to GA4, where you had to be a little bit more explicit, but you don't need to add custom events to the site. They know when users are checking out, you can plug and play out of the box metrics how do they know that information? It's just their client access to your website. Yeah. Well, talking about security, making it better. We've seen some really weird things that third parties uh, were doing. So can you talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we were seeing with the landscape as it was where third parties can just, you know, scrape other, other third party cookies as well? Yeah. And this messaging is really for if you own a web property, listen up. Client side access is always tricky because you're basically giving your, your user's browser to these third parties. They have access. They can scrape for information. So even if you have an agreement, a contract and an endpoint that says it's sending over just, you know, purchase IDs, the amount total and other, it's really a lot of trust that they're not just binding event listeners to the page. Really, we have to discuss the architecture of these things. So when I load up a third-party pixel, say uh, a meta conversion tag or an Instagram tag to an e-commerce site, basically you're loading up their third-party script. Uh, it will be like a main JS file and you, you build the, the data points that you're sending to this endpoint, but ultimately you are sideloading to your page a third-party script that you have no control over. You don't host it. It's subject to change at any time. It's their proprietary solution. And what that script could be doing is actually just loading other scripts. So it's actually happened in the past. We use site auditing tools all the time. And what you find is a lot of piggybacking scripts. You know, it, it, it's not everyone rolls their own solution from the top down. This is including your vendors. If they need a piece of functionality, they might load another script from someone else. And what was actually happening in this case with an ad retargeting pixel that we had on our site, they had a sub process, a third party piggybacking script. And that third party was actually a Russian domain. So inside of our trust arc modal, I mean, we had to swarm on this pretty quickly, especially with, you know, tensions rising high at the moment to ask the vendor to break ties with this, put them on a disallow list, remove it from our modal and ensure that their property wasn't including this script onto our site. And these scripts can be guilty of all sorts of things. This one in particular actually had an event listener that was just blanketly attaching itself to every form input field on the site. So newsletter, sign up, but also think about a checkout form submission <laughs> with credit card information and other. And on every key press, it would send the totality of information what you provided in that input to this third party. 
So regardless yeah. of whether or not we like this solution any better, the Google trust us, we know best, a change needed to happen, right? And I feel like Google spent a lot of time trying to figure out the right way to attack the problem. What were some of the other ways that they were talking about potentially doing it? Pretty much um, the privacy API sandbox is the premier solution. They also have an approach with partitioning cookies called chips. This just, you basically need to sign off and configure a very specific way if you are going to share these details, which is good because then you're adding auditing to the process. I agree, a big shift needed to happen. We've been trying to move server side with, with everything for what seems like a while now. The hardest challenge there just goes back to these third parties that originally wanted both a client side and a server side thing turned on. But ultimately, you should be sending explicit information. And, you know, there's another benefit that's going to shake out of this as well. What better way to perform an audit against your site with what details you send to third parties by just, you know, setting fire to the fields, so to speak? Mm -hmm. If everything breaks immediately, then you're going to know who your bad actors are. You're, you're going to weed a lot of things out and, and figure out what was critical to the process. It's almost like this credit card has gotten old. Let's let's cut it up and cancel it and start fresh because these subscription costs have gotten insane. How will this play out? Is there going to be like a Y2K kind of scenario where all of a sudden everything breaks or is it going to play out differently? Um, actually, we're marching through the timeline. It started Q1 this year. 1% of users actually experience the, this new paradigm where their browser is set automatically to deny cookies. There's a few fail safes in place. Mainly part of the utility for auditing your site is opening up developer tools. You might have noticed this if you've done this recently, but there's now a couple of warnings at the bottom that display with a count of how many cookies were tried to be read by a third party or what was written by a third party. And the warning states that these are going to be subject to break once we move uh, full-time to this process sometime, I think, at the end of Q3 this year. But with that, if a site has a lot of infringes to this or a lot of warnings and a site's not able to perform, there's actually nothing you have to do. It should automatically cut over as of now without experiencing breakage to the end user. Now, Q3, when this goes 100%, I, I don't think that's going to continue to be the case. There's a couple things going on right now. One, Google has been deferring this for, for some time. There is actually open litigation in EU right now that I think they have outstanding questions that they need to answer before they turn the clock 100%. But there's also items that you know, clients or, or, you know, web property owners can perform, such as filing for an exemption to this as well. I'm not sure if that's the preferred path. I don't know how many exemptions they're going to grant, but there should be time this year to respond. And if your site breaks, um, there is a fallback process. Uh, you know, hopefully it works, <laughs> right? Q3 is a scary time for e-commerce people. I mean, that's back to school and it's right before the holiday season. So I would imagine it's going to be important to prioritize this over the summer to make sure things are buttoned up. And that's uh, part of the problem as well. I mean, if you raise this, I've, I've been trying to advocate for doing the appropriate auditing steps within clients that I, I work on 100%. And there's... A couple different mentalities going on. One is that now is a good time to clean house. But also, you know, like I was saying before, it's very easy for a company or a product to kind of treat advertising as the, the low totem priority. It, it's hard to promote this as something that we, we should, you know, absolutely be auditing for. Uh, first and foremost is site functionality. Um, it, it's easy uh, there. If you go to the developers.google.com slash privacy sandbox or, or search for the privacy sandbox, Google third-party Google deprecation, there's very easy documentation that's up for ways that you are able to test this, including turning on um, a Chrome 
uh, you know, built-in flag setting, you know, turn off third-party cookies to test for this deprecation. So easily, um, you're able to audit your site for any functionality breaks. And I would highly recommend my premier client has a weekly QA regression schedule. And I was able to pitch for, you know, why not just have them turn on this flag for this week's QA regression. And, you know, it's something like 30 QA engineers placing test orders in lower environments, happy to report no, you know, carts were lost. None of that critical functionality was lost. Still have yet to talk to each one of our vendors. And that, that's probably the hardest part here. And if I were to implore anyone on what they should be focused on, now's the opportunity to audit your site for what tags you're actually using and leveraging, build up that lost uh, roster of who's the owner on our side and who's our point of contact on their side and begin having these conversations. You know, how will this impact the vendor and what are you doing to respond to this change? I'm always curious on these things. Um, and Webb, you, you might remember this is anytime we do kind of an ecosystem audit and we map it out for our clients, they're always surprised how many systems are in there. I think the same thing applies to tags, right? Like Donald. So I'd be curious, you know, pre and post audit, how shocked are people at how many tags are actually in there? It's always shocking. I mean, I, I feel like I've been um, raising the flag on the number of tags that we've been using for so long. So many of them are duplicative or, you know, redundant. And it's, it happens naturally, you know, it, you're always merge appending a, a new tag, you're never taking off or removing tags, there's, there's never that process, right? It's no, I need hot jar, no, I need a win, no, I need this added to the site. Now they're, they're promising this lift, no one's going through and saying, we, we've had them on for so long, are they still performing? Can we remove this? They just see it as additional lift add, everything is add, add, add. And they're still collecting data while they're connected to your application as well. Just because you're not using their service doesn't mean they're not pulling the data. Absolutely. Yeah, even if you're not. So a lot of these will have, you know, campaign dashboards where you create campaigns and, and try to help the, the funnel process. Exactly like you just said, if, if you're not leveraging them for any sort of campaign functionality, then it's just free data that you're shoveling off to a third party. And, you know, it, it's valuable. Data data is money. Outside of just the, the security concerns, you know, we talk about all these tags being on the site. Talk about the performance concerns and some of the benefit uplift you get from going through that process. Yeah, that's exactly it. Developers know, but for everyone else, if you add another embed to your site, if you add another point of JS to your site, it's a performance cost just to download the thing. So if you're talking about, you know, uh, I'm in a global market, we're broken out by region, North America's is something like 66 vendors for one of the clients that I'm working on. That's 66 JS files that we're loading. And, you know, HTTP2 only can load 12 concurrent files at a time. You're, depending on how you load those tags, hopefully it's deferred, hopefully it's async and kicked to the lowest part of the page. But... If it's loading up higher, you're basically breaking or delaying the user's time to interactive. The, you know, when you load up a site and you can actually click on links or get that product into your cart, you're creating a disconnect. And I think users, you'll see this data everywhere, have a massive distrust with sites that do not perform lightning fast. I think the acceptance has gone from when I started, it was something like eight seconds was great. Now it's something like if you don't load in, in 0.5 to two seconds, something's majorly wrong and, and users get suspicious of your site. Yeah, gone are the days of going to get a coffee while something's loading. <laughs> I think we're, <laughs> we're aging ourselves a little bit on that one. But it's funny, I swear we didn't mastermind this, but that connects directly to the episode we did with Jason Anthony, where it's like those performance increases directly relate to increased revenue numbers that you can have. So the optimist in me just hopes that this kind of forces the discipline that people will get their arms around, like what's really on your site, what's embedded in there, and then also be more intentional about what you're doing with the data, right? And and build better experiences around that intentional use because you're, you're going to have to be smarter, right? Absolutely. Uh, this is going to force a massive paradigm shift. It's going to really promote and 
cause a, a closer eye on all of the things that we load to our site. It's going to impact your marketing departments. It's, it, there's going to be a lot of maybe tough conversations coming down the road, but ultimately from Google's position, now's the time to have them. I think there's a, a video out there by Google and they, they say something like, we, we built the house and we didn't know what the intent was going to be. And now that we know what these things are used for, it's time to start regulating them. I mean, that's true. This is just going to cause a, a, a major shift. Hopefully it won't be real uh, immediate dollar impact to your shop, but advertising is certainly going to take a hit. And like you said, Q3, we're going right into the holiday season, a big time for e-commerce platforms. So I will say this is that this is a real li tinfoil lined hat. It, it's on tight, right? Uh, I firmly believe that, you know, there are parts of the Google organization that I don't trust, but Google has always been a company that's trying to build a better web. They really are. And they see this as a major issue across all sites. If it's performance, if it's security, it's a problem. And they've been really, really slow and, and careful about how they're rolling this out. And sure, they're, you know, it's, it's anti competitive a little bit because they're basically using the fact that they have the, the biggest browser stake and they also have one of the biggest analytic platforms they're tying those two things together. But at the end of the day, this is a great move for people that own a web property and for the internet as a whole. We do need to find solutions to get around the problem. And a lot of the analytics and a product costs you $29.99 a month or whatever it is, but they're offsetting that with your, your data. But now this gives you the the property holder, the right to go like, hey, I want that product. I'll trade you some data for that product and get to, you get to own that a little bit more. Whether or not it actually turns out to be that way or they just try to figure out some sort of way to get the, the product and data for free again well, remains to be seen. Do, do you guys think that this like um, finally pushes a lot more people into being great with zero party data or do they does that can get kicked down the road with the workarounds? Uh, no, I think it's going to force it. A little bit. It has to. Yeah. It, it, I don't see any other way, which is ultimately a good thing. That server side we've been pushing for, yes, right now they're they're kind of using it as a two-handed play, like let's get bulls, but that has to change at some point. And that's ultimately where we need to go. Because that also saves performance and increases security and privacy as well. Like that that's the ultimate move that needs to happen. And you know, Google's in that camp as well. You can load Google Ads server side as no one needs access to the DOM. And if you can defer all of that traffic, all that performance cost saved and, and privacy and security saved, that is where I'd like to see this go. Yeah. There are platforms that their their sole existence is to be this this data layer for you, right? Like you can feed it from any port and you can pull from it in any port, right? So there definitely is going to be a couple of new industries born out of this product lines. But I think those are very real products that definitely need to be used. Yeah, the, the optimist in me hopes that somewhere down the line, zero party done well creates better experiences for us as the consumer, ideally puts maybe some of that ad spend back in our pockets rather than exploiting our data, you know, a couple layers up. And But I also know that might be a little naive, right? <laughs> well, think about the challenges this is going to put for the entire media market, right? Like the entire media industry is built upon the fact that I'm pulling data and I'm reselling your data. And when I can't do that anymore, what happens to all of those free services that we know and love? And then AI happens and it fixes <laughs> That's everything. True. <laughs> you buy three AIs and everything's good to go. <laughs> Solved. Ship it. Uh, well, this is fun, guys. Uh, Donald, thanks so much for joining us. I always like to finish with one question, which is what's, what's the best advice you've ever received in life or career? Oh, in life? Oh, I, I would just say stay curious. I'll, I'll always pull on that thread. I love it. Well, it's me with the name of George. I'm, I'm always down with that. And Curious George is, I'm a big fan. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, thank you so much.